Hello and welcome to the fourth episode of Karl Marx's 18th premiere of Louis Napoleon reading group series. Today is Thursday the 21st of May 2020 and I'm your host Tom O'Brien. This week we start chapter 2, The Downfall of the Republicans. I have the new patron Patrick M. McInerney to thank. If you like today's episode want to hear more of this type of thing, perhaps you could consider becoming a patron. For only $5 a month, you get two patron-only episodes, the regular episodes a few days early, and the right to vote on the next reading group series. Your support really does make this show possible. Okay, let's join the discussion. Okay, so today in the it's the second chapter as they said here, what do they call it here, Marx.org? They call it the downfall of the Republicans. Okay, so we're going to talk today about how the Republicans basically screwed it up and let Louis Bonaparte in through the back door. So we got to, one thing we've got to remember is we had, in 1848, in February, we had the revolution. And then in April, we had the election of the Constituent National Assembly, whose job was to to basically get the constitution together and get some organic laws, as they call them, together. And then in December of 1848, they elected the president, who turned out to be Louis Bonaparte, and at the same time, the National Assembly. So we got two bodies. We got this Constituent National Assembly also, at the same time, they also had the National Assembly, which is kind of like a parliament going. So that's our general. OK, so he's going to talk about true. What did he call him here? The true Republican, the true bourgeois. Is that what he calls them? Not the well, pure uh, Republicans or mm. the tricolor Republicans. Yeah, yeah. No, the, the pure Republicans, because in a way, they're actually alienated from actual kind of expressions of bourgeois interests. And they were sort of an ideological clique around a respected sort of newspaper that Marx thought was, you know, fake news, more or less. So this is the, the national. So let's read a bit here where he talks about what, what the role of the national was here. Let me see. Esri, would you like to read this big paragraph here? Okay. Under the bourgeois monarchy of Louis-Philippe, it had formed the official Republican opposition and consequently a recognized component part of the political world of the day. It had its representatives in the chambers and a considerable sphere of influence in the press. Its Paris organ, the National, was considered just as respectable in its way as the Journal des Debats. Its character corresponded to this position under the constitutional monarchy. It was not a faction of the bourgeoisie held together by great common interests and marked off by specific conditions of production. It was a clique of Republican-minded bourgeois writers, lawyers, officers, and officials that owed its influence to the personal antipathies of the country to Louis Philippe, to memories of the old Republic, to the Republican faith of a number of enthusiasts, above all, however, to French nationalism, whose hatred of the Vienna treaties and of the alliance with England it stirred up perpetually. A large part of the following of the national had under Louis Philippe was due to this concealed imperialism, which would consequently confront it later, under the Republic as a deadly rival in the person of Louis Bonaparte. It fought the aristocracy of finance, as did all the rest of the bourgeois opposition. Polemics against the budget, which in France were closely connected with fighting the aristocracy of finance, procured popularity too cheaply and material for puritanical leading articles too plentifully to not be exploited. The industrial bourgeoisie was grateful for it, for its slavish defense of the French protectionist system, which it accepted, however, more on national grounds than on the grounds of national economy. The bourgeoisie as a whole for its vicious denunciation of communism and socialism. For the rest, the party of the national was purely Republican. That is, it demanded a Republican instead of monarchist form of bourgeois rule and above all, the lion's share of this rule. About the conditions of this transformation, it was by no means clear in its own mind. 
On the other hand, what was clear is daylight to it and publicly acknowledged at the reform banquets in the last days of Louis Philippe was its unpopularity with the democratic petty bourgeois and in particular with the revolutionary proletariat. These pure Republicans, as is indeed the way with pure Republicans, were already at the point of contenting themselves in the first instance with a regency of the Duchess of Orleans. When the February revolution broke out, and assigned their best known representatives a place in the provisional government. From the start, they naturally had the confidence of the bourgeoisie and a majority of the constituent national assembly. The socialist elements of the provisional government were excluded forthwith from the executive commission, which the national assembly formed when it met. And the party of the national took advantage of the outbreak of the June insurrection to discharge the executive commission and therewith to get rid of its closest rivals the petty bourgeois or democratic Republicans. Covignac, the, ge the general of the Republican bourgeois part who commanded the June massacre, took the place of the executive commission with a sort of dictatorial power. Meras, former editor in chief of the national became the perpetual president of the constituent national assembly and the ministries, as well as all other important posts, fell to the portion of the pure Republicans. Okay, so that's a kind of a good roundup in, as to what the pure Republicans were. <laughs> what, do you, what do we think? Uh, that's so good. I think, I think he's a sassy bitch. Oh, it's so <laughs> sassy. These pure Republicans, as it is indeed the way with pure Republicans, were already at the point of contenting themselves in the first instance with the regency of the Duchess of Orléans. <laughs> <laughs> it's just Boom. instantly Boom. give up on republicanism. <laughs> Tom, 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 we have we have a new challenger appears. We have a new challenger appears. We have we have a return of the table meister himself, yes. Emmanuel. Yes. How's it hey, going? How's hey, lockdown? How Is there a lockdown? Hey. There's no lockdown hey. where you are. Uh, th there, is, there is no lockdown, but there is mandatory social distancing and quarantining and, and stuff like that. So you, you're allowed to leave your home. You just, you know. So just normal Sweden. Then. Yes. Just mandatory social distancing. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we just we just did the, one of the big first paragraphs there where Marx basically described uh, who and how shitty the pure Republicans were. It seems to me kind of obvious that these pure Republicans would always fall over and be happy with the new different king? Because is that not always the way with kind of liberal Republicans, this type, a lot of the time? A lot of the time, yes. For example, in Canada, among the liberals, there's a very tiny faction of what you might call pure Republicans who are, are like insistent on liberal Republicanism but they have absolutely no influence as a whole since like the 60s. And most of them are completely content with constitutional monarchy. It's very unusual that like once the liberals get power, they actually give a shit about this. What really drives them is allowing the bourgeoisie to, to have power. Like if you look at your, to Europe, right, you've got, you've got royalty in England, you've got royalty in Spain, you've got royalty in Sweden. You got royalty in Netherlands, like you got, like it, it's actually, I'd say it's at least fifty percent of European states still have royal families. You know, even in parts of Germany, they still have princes and shit in Germany. Now they're not actual, but they still have their old titles. Not so much in the eastern ones, but like I suppose anywhere where Stalin got his hands on, where the, you know the they tend to get rid of the kings and queens. But like if you go like the western part of Europe, it's it's pretty much fifty fifty. You still have a king in uh, Sweden, don't you? This king in Denmark, this king yeah. in Belgium, this king in Holland, this king in Spain. Isn't it the case that none of the Nordic social democracies are uh, republics? Is there a king uh, of Finland? Finland, is a Finland. Oh, yeah, Finland's Finland is a republic. Right, 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 right. right, right. Yeah. There is the king of rock. There is none higher. <laughs> the king of pop. Wasn't 1848 that that revolution basically? It started because of a bungle of the state's bungling of the response to the banquets, and the intent was never really like to revolt, but to just reform and make like a better constitutional monarchy. So even the birth of the republic itself, and it, he probably gets into this, I don't remember, but the birth of the republic itself was an accident, 
and never really the attention of the so-called Republicans. Yeah, like it was an, it was actually the proletariat that, that brought it on. The proletariat who did the fighting, but it was the state's bungling of their response that kind of started up the whole thing, basically. The note about the aristocracy of finance. So not only are we struggling against, you know, the monarchist faction, but there's, you know, essentially a financial faction that Marx doesn't identify with uh, the bourgeoisie. Yeah, yeah, because the aristocracy of finance is associated with the or- Orleanists, right? They would be willing to ally with the Duchess of Orleans, who was also allied with the aristocracy of finance. And we also saw this, like, uh, you know, in the recent episode of Revolutions, we see that, like, there is a constitutional monarchist faction that forms after the revolution of 1905 in Russia, which is associated with, like, the big bourgeoisie, this kind of aristocracy of finance, like, not even really interested in republicanism because they know they're going to get some kind of vote in whatever kind of constitutional monarchist arrangement is uh, set up. The, the aristocracy of finance is going to be directly funding the state coffers, right? So they kind of always get a vote, except in the most absolutist arrangement. So I interpreted this a little bit differently. And, and for the viewers or, or listeners out there, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm not reading this in English. I'm reading the Swedish translation specifically for, <laughs> for, for, for this kind of purpose in, in order to uh, sort of without if I get a different impression. The way I read this is that he he paints this picture of, on the one hand, a very loose coalition of bourgeois interests of lawyers and accountants and, and whatnot who are Republicans, and as with the rest of the bourgeois opposition, against the financial aristocracy. So from what I gather of like the playing field here, you have one team of, I guess I would say like classical liberal faction of basically like a managerial class, like a secular managerial class against a more sort of traditional aristocracy and monarchy friendly financial elite. And that one of the things here is that the call for modernization and, and, and secularization and so on. He doesn't mention secularization spe- specifically, but so this Republican faction is, you know, they're all about life, liberty and Bentham and, and, and all the rest of it. And so they don't like they don't like those elites who are in, in league with the monarchy, essentially. But when it when it comes, you know, when push comes to shove they still don't hesitate to ally with not the monarchy, but still, you know, wealthy, well-off individuals such as the Duchess of Orléans in order to further their, their, their cause. So that's, that's kind of, that, that's kind of how, how I, how I read that. But wouldn't allying with the Duchess of Orléans imply also not allying with Louis Philippe, but allying with the Orléanists to some degree? Yeah, I think they were opposed to, they were like the loyal opposition to the Orleanists. Like the Orleanists was basically the super large bourgeois, the industrial and the finance large capital were happy enough there. But the smaller and, you know, lower down petty bourgeois, you know, just the lawyers, you know, the PMC, your professional managerial class, you weren't happy (laughs) with it. Because they weren't represented. We must remember at the time when Louis Philippe was king, they had an elected National Assembly. I don't know what it was called or whatever. But it only only 1%, I think, 1% of the, of the male population was actually able to vote. And there was lots of people who owned like pretty large amount of land and stuff like who weren't able to vote. And primarily that was who the nation, the, that paper represented. And that's who the pure Republicans were. Like if the pure Republicans, I bet you if they were said, if they had a reform where they said 10% of you can now vote, there'd be no such thing as the pure Republicans. That suit, that looks to find some. Okay, let, oh. let's, let, let's keep going. Wait, look at this dog. That is a, what did they call oh. them? What type of dog is it again? Oh. This, is a, this is a whippet. A whippet, that's right. My uncle has a whippet. It was officially the dumbest dog ever, oh. ever, ever. Oh. Is your dog dumb? Oh. My uncle's dog was so he, he, dumb. <laughs> he's, he's not that dumb, but I mean, he's, he's not the smartest dog either. There's nothing behind yeah, our eyes. Sure if you look at a whippet, though. if you look uh-huh. at, the, at a whippet's eyes, there's, there's like nothing behind them. They just nothing like, but love, Tom. Nothing they're just but like love and empty, sentience. They're empty, dark marbles, I'm telling you. No. My, un- my uncle had this dog Sweet called... Dog. 
he called it Whippy. You know, it was a very he thought a lot about the name. But uh, he he was a farmer, and uh, he had like the dog would piss everywhere. I mean, it would just piss everywhere, no matter what you would do. You put it in your car, it would piss in the car. It would put it, it would sneak into your bedroom, it would piss on your bed. It piss everywhere. It was a goddamn nightmare. And and he would look at you so dumbly and so stupidly, you couldn't be mad at him. That's that's a dog that knows his game theory. Yeah. <laughs> my my uncle had a he's a farmer and he had a had like a, a guy from the Department of, of Agriculture come in to like check out some stuff, you know, official. And the official went to go to his car and the back seat of his car, he had a whole load of files and he opened the door and Whippy jumped in through his legs up into the, all his files <laughs> and he pissed on them all. <laughs> and my uncle was like, my uncle was like not having a good so time. He literally with pissed on the government. Yeah, yeah. He literally. And my uncle was not having a good time with like the, this guy. He was like a real stickler oh. for something or other. And he pissed all over all his files and destroyed them. And so they had to take them out of the car and bring them into the kitchen and lay them out near like the heaters and like have the piss dry oh, off them oh, and your man no. sitting there like stewing. Oh man, it made me laugh when I heard that. I'm sorry, but Tom, but that whippet has done more to fight the bourgeois state than all of us combined. It's true. <laughs> Certainly more than me. Certainly more than me. <laughs> I think it's like, has anybody ever read the book, uh, The Good, the Good Soldier Shvek? Oh yeah. I had to read that for uh, school when I was in, in Prague. Man, it's fucking hilarious. But like he has this brilliant, uh, brilliant uh, way of wrecking people's heads, where you can't tell whether he's an idiot or a, or a genius, and that's like quippy. He's like he looks like a total idiot, but he did piss all over the guy's files, so we got to give him that. That's right, Tom. That's right. Okay. Slavoj well, like Zizek so, might have picked up a few tricks from uh, Shvek. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I reckon. those black marbles of strategy. Okay, let's keep going. We're getting nowhere fast here today, right? Okay, let me just read this little paragraph here. I, I underlined this one. I thought it was really nice. The Republican bourgeois faction, which had long regarded itself as the legitimate heir of the July monarchy, thus found its fondest hope succeeded. It attained power, however, not as it dreamed under Louis Philippe through a liberal revolt of the bourgeoisie against the throne, but through a rising of the proletariat against capital, a rising laid low with grape shot. What it had conceived as the most revolutionary event turned out in reality to be the most counter-revolutionary. The fruit fell into its lap, but it fell from the tree of knowledge, not from the tree of life. So what the hell does that last line mean? Oh, well, you just it's like they came to understand how useless they were instead of actually winning, right? Like the tree of knowledge is like, oh, no, you're actually just like this real paper tiger and you're going to get completely bowled over by the forces of counter-revolution. And so the yeah. Tree of Life did not feed these uh, pure Republicans. It sums up the next few paragraphs where he goes into the very toothless expressions of universal rights that are like, you have a universal right to do X, except when you know we feel like it would be bad. And of course the government will have to say it's okay. And all these like asterisk rights, basically. And there's also a sense throughout this whole pamphlet of what the liberal bourgeoisie thought was gonna be a revolutionary event that would overthrow monarchy forever. What liberal republicanism thought was going to overthrow monarchy forever actually ended up more or less being part of how monarchies kept themselves alive. I think that's a good point from, from Marx that, you know, what got you into power in the end was not this sort of grandiose Roman revolution with pomp and circumstance, but it was from the fact that you just used the military to combat proletarians half a year ago, and that kept all your opposition out of parliament, and then you just won by default. A rising laid low with grape shot, with a form of cannons. And that's a reference to Napoleon, I think, as well, who said that in was it seventeen something ninety nine or something, he scared off like the was it the enrage with the whiff of grape shot. I don't think he actually had to kill anybody. It was just the smell of it, wasn't that right? Napoleon Bonaparte was called in on the Republican side to massacre a sort of royalist crowd, more or less, and with the whiff of grape shot. Thomas Carlyle, the 
British reactionary historian, essentially thought that this ended the revolution and also established Napoleon as someone that wasn't just like a low level commander, but as someone that could command great armies. Yeah, there was hundreds dead in the streets. It was a royalist revolt that the Republic crushed and in crushing created the conditions within itself for the rise of Napoleon. It was a massacre, yeah. Oh, OG Bonaparte, not, not Louis. Let's read just these little bits here. That the inevitable general staff of the liberties of 1848, personal liberty, liberty of the press, of speech, of association, of assembly, of education and religion, etc., received a constitutional uniform which made them invulnerable. For each of these liberties is proclaimed as the absolute right of the French citizen, but always with the marginal note that it is unlimited so far as it is not limited by the equal rights of others and the public safety, or by laws which are intended to mediate just this harmony of the individual liberties with one another and with the public safety. For example, it gives a few here. Education is free. Freedom of education shall be enjoyed under the conditions fixed by law and under the supreme control of the state. And then one last bit. The Constitution, therefore, constantly refers to future organic laws which are put into effect, those marginal notes, and regulate the enjoyment of these unrestricted liberties in such manner that they will collide neither with one another nor with the public safety. And later, these organic laws were brought into being by the friends of order and all those liberties regulated in such manner that the bourgeoisie, in its enjoyment of them, finds itself unhindered by the equal rights of the other classes. Where it forbids these liberties entirely to the others or permits enjoyment of them under conditions that are just so many police traps, this always happens solely in the interest of public safety. That is, the safety of the bourgeoisie, as the Constitution prescribes. Do, 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 do. Yeah. Beow, 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 beow. <laughs> yeah. And uh, right, right before it, there's a, a lovely thing about universal suffrage, like Emmanuel was talking about. The new constitution was at bottom only the republicanized edition of the Constitutional Charter of 1830. The narrow electoral qualification of the July monarchy, which excluded even a large part of the bourgeoisie from political rule, was incompatible with the existence of the bourgeois republic. In lieu of this qualification, the February Revolution had at once proclaimed direct universal suffrage. The bourgeois Republicans could not undo this event. They had to content themselves with adding the limiting provisio of six months' residence in the constituency. The old organization of the administration, the municipal system, the judicial system, the army, etc., continued to exist inviolate. Or, where the Constitution changed them, the change concerned the table of contents, not the contents. The name not the subject matter. We'll, we'll get to this later when he talks about like the president and the parliament, but just here, I think this still holds up as a scathing critique of the US political system. No, I mean, that that's absolutely what was echoing through my head as we were as we were doing that. As, as I was reading this, you know, I was like, oh God, yeah, I have nothing but disappointed so noises. <laughs> How can we keep people uh, from voting if everyone's supposed to vote? So there's a bit here where Marx, he starts talking about kind of like the importance of, of, of kind of structures. Yeah. So I know we always have Derek here and Derek's always going on about, oh, yeah, well, you know, there are so many different things at the state level with the Democrats, this and that. And they're in there by law and like, blah, 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 blah. I, I, Derek is right. You know, uh, let's see what Marx is going to say about a similar thing where he talks about like the structure of the Constitution and the effect that it had. I, I was just going to mention an anecdote here. My advisor in my MA program, who is a student of Marcuse, used to say that, you know, Marcuse, when you talk about the German Revolution, he'd always say, uh, I started to suspect something was wrong when they went to elect the officers of the revolution and they elected all the same people to their previous positions <laughs> just under a revolutionary garb. Uh, and I feel like that's very much this, uh, you know, the table of contents, not the contents themselves kind of revolution. Whenever Marx has content, whenever he says content, he's usually thinking about, you know, class content as well. Sprinkling a bit of the old dialectic on that statement. Because, yeah, he's talking about forms of power. You know, they're not actually transforming the republic. But, you know, part of that is also not actually transforming the monarchy. 
And part of that is also, you know, a description of the, you know, the, the balance of class forces is not actually changed there. Okay, Kyle, do you want to give the next bit a go from where I, I underline here? Okay. In the sequel, both sides accordingly appeal with complete justice to the Constitution. The Friends of Order, who abrogated all these liberties, as well as the Democrats, who demanded all of them. For each paragraph of the Constitution contains its own antithesis, its own upper and lower house, namely liberty in the general phrase, abrogation of liberty in the marginal note. Thus, so long as the name of freedom was respected and only its actual realization prevented, of course in a legal way, the constitutional existence of liberty remained intact, inviolate, however mortal the blows dealt to its existence in actual life. This constitution, made inviolable in so ingenious a manner, was nevertheless, like Achilles, vulnerable in one point. Not in the heel, but in the head, or rather, in the two heads it wound up with. The Legislative Assembly on the one hand, the President on the other. Glance through the Constitution and you will find only the paragraphs in which the relationship of the President to the Legislative Assembly is defined are absolute, positive, non-contradictory, and cannot be distorted. For here, it was a question of the bourgeois Republicans safeguarding themselves. Articles 45 to 70 of the Constitution are so worded that the National Assembly can remove the President constitutionally, whereas the President can remove the National Assembly only unconstitutionally, only by setting aside the Constitution itself. Here, therefore, it challenges its forcible destruction. It not only sanctifies the division of powers like the Charter of 1830, it widens it into an intolerable contradiction. The play of the constitutional powers, as Guizot termed the parliamentary squabble between the legislative and executive power, is in the Constitution of 1848 continually played vabank. Vabank is similar to in poker where you go all in. On one side are 750 representatives of the people, elected by universal suffrage and eligible for re-election. They form an uncontrollable, indissoluble, indivisible National Assembly, a National Assembly that enjoys legislative omnipotence, decides in the last instance on war, peace, and commercial treaties, alone possesses the right of amnesty, and by its permanence, perpetually holds the front of the stage. On the other is the President, with all the attributes of royal power, with authority to appoint and dismiss his ministers independently of the National Assembly with all the resources of the executive power in his hands, bestowing all posts and disposing thereby in France of the livelihoods of at least a million and a half people. For so many depend on the 500,000 officials and officers of every rank. He has the whole of the armed forces behind him. He enjoys the privilege of pardoning individual criminals, of suspending national guards, of discharging with the concurrence of the Council of State, general, cantonal, and municipal councils elected by the citizens themselves. Initiative and direction are reserved to him in all treaties with foreign countries. While the assembly constantly performs on the boards and is exposed to daily public criticism, he leads a secluded life in the Elysian fields and that with article 45 of the constitution before his eyes and in his heart crying to him daily, Flail, il faut mourir, uh, brother, one must die. Your power ceases on the second Sunday of the lovely month of May in the fourth year after your election. Then your glory is at an end. The peace is not played twice. And if you have debts, look to it quickly that you pay them off with the 600,000 francs granted you by the Constitution, unless perchance you'd prefer to go to Clichy on the second Monday of the lovely month of May. Clichy is a debtor's prison on the outskirts of Paris. Thus, whereas the Constitution assigns power to the President, it seeks to secure moral power for the National Assembly. Apart from the fact that it is impossible to create a moral power by paragraphs of law, the Constitution here abrogates itself once more by having the President elected by all Frenchmen through direct suffrage, while the votes of France are split up among the 750 members of the National Assembly they are here, on the contrary, concentrated on a single individual. 
While each separate representative of the people represents only this or that party, this or that town, this or that bridgehead, or even only the mere necessity of electing someone as the 750th without examining too closely either the cause or the man, he is the elect of the nation. And the act of his election is the trump that the sovereign people plays once every four years. The elected National Assembly stands in a metaphysical relation, but the elected president in a personal relation to the nation. The National Assembly indeed exhibits in its individual representatives the manifold aspects of the national spirit. But in the president, this national spirit finds its incarnation. As against the assembly, he possesses a sort of divine right. He is president by grace of the people. Wow, that's just brilliant stuff. Like, so it seems like so obvious when you just say apply to, say, actual presidential polities at the moment, like, say, France is one and America is another. It's goddamn is the president is the focus of, of everything. Nobody gives a damn about these little small representatives, the House representatives, the Senate. Say, compared to, say, somewhere like Ireland, where the president is like a joke. It's all about like the prime the, the Taoiseach, the prime minister, or in the UK, you know, it's it's not about the Queen, it's all about like Boris Johnson. So it's like these structures do matter. You know, they, they really matter. And and the, and how these things are structured will determine a lot of the a lot of strategy and the politics going forward. I guess it's important to note that the president in this case still had the power of appointing officials which gave him a sort of natural support base. And then also the assembly directly blocked any kind of positive relationship with the people, right? Like they were basically negating all of the liberties in the margins. And so, you know, their kind of diffuse presence as a, a representative of the popular just didn't mean anything because they weren't actually providing the goods. Whereas Bonaparte, yeah, did have that advantage of being the incarnation of the nation, in addition to having a whole bunch of people on his payroll that he could, you know, mobilize to his side. I read that kind of differently in, in this huge chunk of a paragraph in that he says that the 750 representatives in the Swedish translation, he, he really makes it sound like they are supposed to be the fair representation and he treats them as if they are. So, like, on the one hand, you have a, a fair representation of the actual country embodied by 750 representatives, including representatives of people who just don't care, right? And, and, and who just vote for someone in order to vote. But then on the other hand, you have this president dude who has the power of the military branch, etc., and who gets the national attention and who is supposed to be the, the living embodiment of, of the nation. And those two are incompatible because on one side you have debate and quabble, a representative sample of the actual nation, which is quabbling all the time and different interests, etc. On the other hand, you have this absolute authority figure who really embodies like the, the national spirit. And so people just stop caring about the, the, the legislative assembly and it attains this sort of metaphysical relationship. Just like the, I've read US politics, I still don't know how the Senate works. I still have no fucking clue what the fuck they do, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> they uh, shouldn't be there. That's that's yeah. what they do. So that that's kind of what I understood. That it is metaphysical for me, whereas Trump kind of embodies Merca. Hell yeah. The thing as well is here must be noted is that Napoleon, won the election i think with i think about 85 percent of the vote so he was like an absolute landslide and he wasn't front and center once he won even though he had executive authority all the laws and all the all the stuff that's in the papers about what's this new law going to be what's this organic law blah 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 that was all being done in the assembly and so they take all the heat and he can sit on the sidelines going, oh, this is terrible. Look at me. And he's able right. to play against it. So, like, you know, he's in a much stronger position, say, than you would look at, say, a Trump today because Trump's elected on 25 percent of the vote or something like that. You know, 50 percent of people vote right, and right. of them vote for him. That's partially <laughs> true. I think there's still a lot of parallels to Trump and the U.S. that I found kind of eerie. It obviously isn't like a one-to-one -one comparison, but 
Trump does the same kind of move where he pits himself as like the true embodiment of real America against this political class of the Senate, which is metaphysical and doesn't do anything. He taps into that resentment and like, he's kind of not wrong. He's wrong about a lot of things, but like our fucking senators do suck and they are doing shit. Yeah, this is uh this is something that Matt Chrisman brought up when he interviewed Mike Duncan. It's probably the only like full Chapo episode I've ever listened to. It's really good. Uh, you should check it out if you haven't. And Mike Duncan kept kind of deflecting the Trump comparisons, being like, nah, you don't understand. Louis Napoleon had like some cred. He wrote books about, you know, relief to the poor before he wasn't the, like a reality TV emb- embodiment of a boss. But more or less, I think what Manuel's trying to get at is is just Yeah, the basic thesis of the paragraph. I love that, you know, the Constitution has its Achilles heel in its head in that, you know, it creates a metaphysical assembly of weak ninnies that even though they're supposed to hold the power, they're going to be swept aside by the, you know, big Rambo in the middle. The, the way I read this is, is is not that he's talking specifically about, about Louis N- Napoleon here. He he hasn't gotten into the fact that he won the election or anything yet, but but I think he's making the systematic point that if you set a system up like this, where on the one hand you're supposed to have representatives in the entire country in some sort of council and they make the laws, but on the other hand, the dude who actually enforces those laws and has complete control of the fucking army is one dude, uh, you're in for a hell of a ride, <laughs> you know, uh, and at the end of the day, if, if the president does anything illegal, like, say, stays for longer than he should, the president can always, you know, has a Trump card, pun intended, <laughs> and uh, to call, you know, you and whose army are, are going to stop me exactly. Emmanuel, you said whose army? It should be obvious to us all. The resistance. The resistance <laughs> is going to ride in. There we go. Horseback. Right. Maybe tank back. Yeah, oh, history God. history on tank back. Yeah, with the um, CNN flags flying. Oh, God. No. And, and pussy oh, hats. Jesus. Don't forget the pussy hats. Oh, the uh, pussy hats. No. <laughs> when, when, you read this, like, when, when, you, when you call back to the first paragraph in this entire essay, like, history repeats itself first as a tragedy and then as farce. And you read this, like, he thinks that this is farcical. And I'm like, right. oh, dude, you should wait until you see the U.S., man. Like. <laughs> First as farce, then as farce of, of a farce. Yeah, it's far- farces all the way down. Now we're going to get on to kind of what I, I love. Like Marx is going to point out this kind of idea of how they thought they were, the pure Republicans were so smart that they could thought they could like just manufacture clauses in the constitution that would definitely never lead to them ever losing power. And this kind of idea of like liberals believing in the law as in, like, somehow power is subordinate to the law. It just reminds you, all the stuff that was going on about Brexit, there was constantly lawyers going to the Supreme Court in England saying, oh, but what about this clause here? This goes against this other micro clause and this other thing over here. And everybody was just like, oh, they get thrown out every single time. It just, like, just really, I, I, this just really reminds me of it. So let me just read this little paragraph here. They sought to cheat destiny by a catch in the Constitution through Article 3, according to which every motion for a revision of the Constitution must be supported by at least three quarters of the votes cast in three successive debates with an entire month between each, with added proviso that not less than 500 members of the National Assembly must vote. Thereby, they made the impotent attempt to continue exercising a power when only a parliamentary minority, as which they already saw themselves prophetically in their mind's eye, a power which, at that time, when they commanded a parliamentary majority and all the resources of governmental authority, was daily slipping more and more from their feeble hands. I really like that analysis. Yeah, and that is very reminiscent of, uh, or Brexit is very reminiscent of this. I, I agree with that. Uh, this, these, these kinds of attempts to resort to like uh, proceduralism, like procedural blocking, it's the same kind of thing that they did with Brexit. It just reminds me of all the sort of like National Lawyers Guild type of activism or yeah, a lot, a lot of the, oh, this is unconstitutional kind of stuff that you see going on that this falls on deaf ears. No, yeah, no one gives a shit. It's like watching Democracy Now. 
It's like, uh, Oof. seriously, it Rip. is. Who do they have on? They always have, what's that? The, the Civil Liberties Union. It's basically the Civil Liberties. Yeah, that ACLU. ACLU. Okay, now we're going to get into basically what what happened to make the military suddenly think for themselves like, hey, well, well why, why can't we get in on this action? <laughs> yeah, we're the guys with all the guns. What about us? So who wants to read a bit of this? Such was the Constitution of 1848, which on December 2nd, 1851, was not overthrown by head, but fell down at the touch of a mere hat. This hat, to be sure, was a three-cornered Napoleonic hat. While the bourgeois Republicans in the Assembly were busy devising, discussing, and voting this Constitution, Kovignac, outside the Assembly, maintained the state siege of Paris. The state of siege of Paris was the midwife of the Constituent Assembly in its travail of Republican creation. If the Constitution is subsequently put out of existence by bayonets, it must not be forgotten that it was likewise by bayonets, and these turned against the people, that it had to be protected in its mother's womb, and by bayonets that it had to be brought into existence. The forefathers of the respectable Republicans had sent their symbol, the tricolor, on a tour around Europe. They themselves in turn departments the state of siege. A splendid invention, periodically employed in every ensuing crisis in the course of the French Revolution. But Barrack and Bivouac, which were thus periodically laid on French society's head to compress its brain and render it quiet, saber, and musket, which were periodically allowed to act as judges and administrators, as guardians and censors, to play policemen and do night watchman's duty, mustache and uniform, which were periodically trumpeted forth as the highest wisdom of society and its rector, were not barrack and boviac, saber and musket, mustache and uniform, finally bound to hit upon the idea of instead saving society once and for all, by proclaiming their own regime as the highest in freeing civil society completely from the trouble of governing itself. Barrack and Boviac, saber and musket, mustache and uniform, were bound to hit upon this idea all the more as they might then also expect better cash payments for their higher services. Whereas from the merely periodic state of siege and transient rescues of society at the bidding of this or that bourgeois faction. Little of substance was gleaned, save some killed and wounded, and some friendly bourgeois grimaces. Should not the military at last one day play state of siege in their own interest and for their own benefit, and at the same time besiege these citizens' purses? Okay. Anybody wants to discuss this paragraph? Pretty straightforward, right? Like you resort to military force to suppress popular power enough times and the military is just going to be like, hey, actually the thing that's regulating society is us. So why don't we get paid better? And why don't we get rid of these, uh, you know, bleeding heart liberals who are uh, always grimacing when they tell us to go kill a bunch of people in the streets? Yeah, it's a, it's a basic point and it's, you know, one of the biggest flaws if not the biggest flaw of liberalism is like what y'all were talking about earlier it's not what's written on paper that's really important it's do you have the means to enforce what is on paper and if you don't all the flowery words in the world don't mean shit when you have a bullet in your head yeah like is, is it is it true that the spanish or sorry the mexican constitution today is the revolutionary one of 1915 or whatever Yes, as far as I understand it. Yeah, and it's full so, of yeah. like it's full of really radical stuff and it's never ever enforced. And even though it's like in there in the goddamn constitution, why not? Because the constitution is obviously it may be written, but it's not actually the power relations that exist in society. They are not there to enforce those ones, so they don't get enforced. And one of the yeah. tragedies is that pretty quickly after the constitution after the revolution and the constitution was drafted, like things went astray. And kind of the final nail, according to a lot of people, is the amendments that were passed. I believe there were amendments that were passed in order to get NAFTA approved, 
which basically um, fucked over the provisions that were beneficial to the existing indigenous peoples in Mexico. And you only have to look at the American constitution, like all the stuff about like, you know, privacy and all that. It's all gone. All that shit's I gone. I mean, there, there was a coup, like as more or less as soon as the bill of rights was passed, the courts were like, nah, none of these apply to the States. Like, and, and the States like for a while had to pass piecemeal each article of the bill of rights as applying to each state until I believe what was the 14th amendment. I, I really feel like the old vulgar Marxist distinction of base and superstructure pretty well describes the relation between constitutional law and actual powers that are supposedly secured by the law, but in fact have their own independent power base that the law may or may not guarantee or be part of see this is kind of interesting because when i went into this is not so much i mean partially the you and whose army argument that you all just made legalism is idealism and and and, and all the rest of it and i agree with that in principle but the, what, what i read into this is more a sort of stab at the bourgeoisie for forgiving the military the power to enact all of this because he makes the point like, okay, you made the military judge you're an executioner in, in all of these cases. Like if you give the military these kinds of powers, they're going to figure out that, you know, th they're going to gain that experience and they're going to figure out to use, this, to use it against you. If you use the, the military as judge you're an executioner, they're going to play judge you're an executioner. But I, I didn't read it as a general like comment about this applies to any sort of military regardless. I, I, I read it as a kind of specific point against this specific revolution where they use the military in this specific case and also crucially where the president has the, the power over that military, that the bourgeoisie themselves taught how to rule. No, I totally agree with what you're saying. And I think like Marx is making a very specific point here about this revolution and how it went wrong. Tom touched, touched on your point too, though, briefly, when we first started talking about this, basically stating that like, when you keep ordering the army to shoot down protesters and stuff like that, uprisings, and you're not paying them well, and all they get from you is your bourgeois agreements is that, you know, slaughtering people, they are going to be like, well, we're the ones who are actually shoring up power. Why aren't we getting paid better? So the point I was making earlier about like kind of a blind spot of liberalism, not realizing that the thing that matters is the guns and not the, the words, I think still applies, but that blind spot only becomes a bigger issue and a crisis of, of political power when there are certain mistakes or missteps made like along these lines, like you're, you're constantly ordering the military to shoot down citizens, but not paying them enough. Right. Like, so that's why if it was a guarantee for the army to turn against a republic, then we would have seen this happen to nearly every republic. But, you know, there has to be a sp specific missteps for that to turn into a real crisis of legitimate power. They, they should have given the soldiers like a bonus for every like socialist they, sh they shot dead. What do you reckon? Like give them 100 francs per commie. That would have done I it. mean, no, but also the, the, from the, the logic the of their own... The uh, approach to military governance. Absolutely. Oh, well, yeah. he, he does kind of make the, that point in, in the first chapter, right? With when you have incentives for, for legislators and rulers to get rid of like dissenters in the interest of public safety to save society. The more you do that, the more unsafe society becomes and the more it needs to be saved. That's kind of kind of akin to you know give a soldier a bonus for uh, for shooting a commie and all of a sudden everyone's a fucking commie, right? Well, here's hoping. Here's hoping. On this episode, you heard the theme tune, The Order of the Pharaonic Jesters, and Night of the Purple Moon 
by Sun Ra and his orchestra. The artwork for the show was created by the Korean artist and author of the 2019 Marx Engels illustration book. You can check out links to his work and Twitter account in the show notes. Thank you for listening and please join me for the next episode of From Alpha to Omega. This show is a member of the Emancipation Network, a Marxist podcast and research collective. Make sure to check out our network sister podcasts, General Intellect Unit, Jumpsuit Utopia, Mortal Science, and Swampside Chats. Thank you.